Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. This is Successful People. This is the ninth day, uh, the 10th day of September 2020. And tomorrow will be September 11th. So it'll be a few years since that happened. Where were you on September 11th? Do you remember? I was in Thailand and thought it was the news. Yeah. Yeah. Well, none of us will ever forget that day, frankly. And, and now we'll it never was, It was the news. Day. I thought it was a movie, I should have said. <laughs> really? Crazy, isn't it? All right, everybody. Well, welcome. I'll, I'll mute everyone uh, to keep quiet in the background, but you're welcome to unmute yourself. Welcome, Mc Victoria. Look, it looks like Anna's here with us. Cody and Brad and Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Uh, Nikki. Hi, Nikki. Mary. Heshi. How you doing, Heshi? You know, I never knew all those things about your father, Heshi. Um, uh, as long as I've known you, I never known. I never knew that story. So, I haven't really, I haven't really told it very much. But it'll be a book. I mean, I yes. got it. It needs to be a book. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And uh, I'd be happy to help you any way I can. Okay. Hey, Gary, the beard and Sam. Sam, are you hearing me? Sam Sewell, and uh, somebody looking over your shoulder there. Can't hear you, Sam. You're, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? A little button on the bottom left-hand corner. Well, uh, you can at least hear me, right, Sam? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yeah, very good. I, 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 didn't I don't think I received an email from you recently. Uh, did you send me an email this last week? Is that a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Thumbs up. OK, yes. OK, I, I, I thought it was you. Uh, so anyway, I will, I'll respond to that. Okay, everyone. <clears throat> Last week I asked you the question, what did you learn during this, uh, this COVID experience? And <clears throat> the good things I think we've all, we all learned, but what I want to talk about today is the bad things we learned. Um, and when you have a, a, an epidemic like this or a pandemic like this, everybody's an enemy. Uh, you never can tell whether that person next to you standing four feet away from you might contain, might be carrying some kind of virus that you don't know what it could do to you or anybody else. And so it's, it's created this, uh, this sense of fear around everybody. You go into a grocery store, but he's kind of sidling away from each other. I, I went to a subway just a couple of hours ago to grab a quick bite and Everybody was social distancing. There wasn't a lot of conversation going on like there used to be. You know, you'd chat and you'd be in line with somebody. You'd chat. How's it going? How's your day going? Where are you at? What are you doing here? What's, what's, uh, what's going on in your life? You know, <clears throat> just normal, ordinary uh, interaction with ordinary people. And so I don't know how long that will be and how long will that go on? Probably, probably years where we'll always be a little concerned. Back in the days when, uh, when a virus, a flu would affect people, uh, we didn't know the, the, the risks that were around us. And you know, people with 40, 50, 60,000 people would die in the year. Um, and that just was just, uh, did you get your flu shot? No, I haven't got it yet. I think I'll be okay. You know, but if you look at all the numbers, 30, 40, 50,000 people were dying every single year from some kind of a flu. Uh, yet we weren't all that worried about it. And you watch Fauci on the television, he, he says that, uh, you know, he wishes that really nobody shook hands anymore. That, that's really one of the problems. When you shake hands with somebody, you have the possibility of infecting them with a disease or them you. He says, I, he says, I wish that that was a habit that was that would be dropped, that we would no longer shake hands. And uh, so there, there's some bad things that we've learned uh, in this pandemic. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a, one of my favorite stories. We'll have a, sh a short conversation today. Uh, one of my favorite stories that, um, well, let, me, let me share the PowerPoint here. By the way, um, this, this is one of my favorite cartoons. You know, 
this is this is our plan before 2020. <laughs> this is this is the this is reality. This is the way it is. Um, getting whatever you want to do is is difficult. It takes challenges, right? Um, so let me share with you a story that uh, that really I would like you to tell somebody this week, because. Uh, because of the challenges of the COVID situation, I think it's, uh, I think it's kind of hurt us. So can you see this picture of Tolstoy? Is that visible to everybody? Samaya, can you see it? Yes. Tolstoy was a great writer. He wrote the, the largest novel, uh, War and Peace. It's like 500,000 words. It's the largest novel I think you'll ever pick up in your life. I think it's the largest novel ever written or, you know, one of the, one of the largest novels ever written, War and Peace. But he also wrote a lot of short stories. And his short stories were very powerful. My brother-in-law gave me a, a copy of an old book of the short stories of Tolstoy. And I, when I read through those stories, some stories you, you might have remembered. Uh, one is a story about a guy who says that, who is given the opportunity to, to have as much land as he can run around in a day. And so he starts early in the morning and starts running. And he runs, you know, it's a four corner, it's a square. So he has to run as fast as he can run. And he's very greedy, so he just keeps running straight and then he turns right. And so by the time he runs in around all the land he could own in a single day would become his. And so he runs the entire length of, uh, of, the, of the, the route that he ran. And so he would own an enormous amount, amount of land. But just as the sun is going down, he collapses at the finish line dead because he killed himself by just running too, for too much stuff rather than going for a little, something a little more modest. That was a great story, and I, and I, I love that Tolstoy story. <clears throat> but one of, my, one of my favorite stories is called The Three Questions. And whenever you start wondering about, um, about how life is affecting everybody, especially during this pandemic, these, these are three questions that I would like you to keep in your mind and tell this story to somebody this week. And in the meantime, while you're, while you're telling this story, you can, you know, bump elbows with them and just say, the, this is a story that, that my mentor shared with me today. It's a Tolstoy story. I've probably never heard of it before. Uh, some of you have been around me for a while, probably heard this story, but this, this was a story I had never heard of before. Um, a king decided he wanted to be the greatest king for his, for his uh, subjects. And so he wondered, what does a great king do? And how could I be the greatest king that has ever uh, reigned uh, over my people? How can I be a better king? And so he, he was asking questions like, for instance, uh, when, when is the most important time? And what, what, who are the most important people in my kingdom? And what is the most important action? What, what's the most important thing I could do? So he would ask his advisors and his wise men. He would say, if, if, I, if I want to be a great king, I want to have the answers to these three questions. Because um, I want to make sure that, that I'm doing always during the, the most important thing, during the most important time with the most important people, uh, that, that would make me a great king, I think. And so he would ask his advisors, and they would all give him all kinds of different answers. His politicians would give him a different answer than his religious leaders gave him different answers. His wise men give him different answers. Um, his business people give him different answers. Everybody gave up the different kind of answers. Uh, and he just didn't feel like the answers they were giving him were, were good. Uh, he just, they just didn't feel right to him. So he says, well, let, me go, let me go find this, the hermit up in the mountains who has probably got the answer to the questions I'm, I'm asking. And so he realized that if he went to the hermit, the, that the hermit would 
more than likely not receive him um, dressed up in his fancy clothes. So he took off his normal kingly robes and rode with his, uh, his soldiers guarding him until he was close to where the hermit's cave would be up, located up the mountain a, a ways. He dressed down so he was not, uh, didn't look any special. And he started to walk up the path by himself. He said, I couldn't come with anybody guarding me because then the, the hermit would be put off by that. So he walked by himself, dressed as an ordinary person and walked uh, all the way the path through the, through the forest as it wound up to where the hermit's cave was. And the hermit was there uh, hoeing in his little garden outside of his little cave. And um, he, he didn't want to waste too much time. He just said, I know you're busy, but I just would like to ask you a question. Uh, a couple of questions like, who were the most important people? And when is the most important time? And what's the most important action that I could be doing just as an ordinary person? Didn't tell him he was asking about his kingship. And the hermit did not respond. The hermit just kept hauling away. Um, hardly acknowledged him. Well, he did acknowledge him. You know, he, he acknowledged him, but he, you know, obviously says, I'm, I'm, I'm busy right now for a moment. Just, just give me a few moments. Well, I'm, I'm, let me think. Let me think about those questions. And the king said, well, well let me hoe for you. Um, I'll, I'll hoe and, and you think, and, and maybe we'll come up with some good answers. And so the hermit sat and he was pondering and the king was hoeing away. And then this, uh, this person came up the hill wounded and the hermit and the king uh, immediately dropped what they were doing and started to, um, to, to, to take care of this person who was obviously wounded and dying. And uh, he didn't say anything to them. He just collapsed and fainted in front of both of them. And so they immediately began to see what the, the wound was and they, they um, got him comfortable. And then they, they, they carried him inside the cave where would be out of the sun and uh, they washed his wound. And uh, it was many hours that they worked with him as the sun rose and started to fall. And the king didn't feel like he could leave because the, the, the fellow's life was in the balance. And both the hermit and himself were um, totally focused on this one guy that was obviously very close to death. It was um, later on in the evening when the, the gentleman's fever broke and uh, he fell into a deep, deeper sleep. And both the hermit and the king, without, without much ado, just both of them just laid down right where they were at and then collapsed themselves and fell asleep. And it wasn't until many hours later when the sun started to rise through the, the mouth of the cave that the sun was striking the king's eyes and he, and he woke up. And um, he found that the gentleman who had been dying the night before, looking intently at the king um, he was awake, the, the king awaked, awake, and the, and the man was, was better now. He, he'd obviously regained his strength, and he was just looking at the king with such great awe and great respect. And, um, and the king said, oh, I'm so happy that you, you survived. We, we worked quite a, quite a long time, and uh, both the, the hermit and I were just so happy to, to know that you're okay. And the hermit had, was outside the cave hoeing again, in his little garden, and uh, the the man said to the ki to the king, not knowing, uh, the man said, um, I, "I don't know if you know who I am, but I am your mortal enemy. You killed my brother as the king, and you killed my brother, and I vowed to kill you. As a matter of fact, when I saw you leaving the city." 
uh, with your uh, with your guards, I followed behind you, and then I noticed that you had dressed down and left your guards behind. And I thought, what a perfect opportunity. And I came out of the hiding to follow you and to kill you. And your some of your guards noticed me and chased me. I got away, but not after having been wounded by your guards. And how I got here to the cave, I'm not really sure. I must have stumbled in. Uh, half alive, and the the hermit tells me that you spent your entire evening trying to save my life, and I just I just got to tell you uh, that uh, that's not the kind of king I thought you were. Um, you're the kind of king I really would like to have as my king, and therefore I. I pledge to you my allegiance as your one of your subjects. And I want you to know that my family will know what you did for me. And uh, it will, it, it will be a different experience. And so I just want to thank you. You, you saved my life. I, I appreciate it. And the king and the man fell on each other's shoulders and hugged and came outside the cave. And the, the, the hermit was there working away in, the, in his little garden. And the king, as the, the, the man and the king were getting ready to leave, going down the path, the king turned back to the hermit and he said, I, I came to ask you some questions. And uh, you never did give me an answer. And the hermit said, well, you have your answer. And the king said, I, I don't understand. And he said, well, when you when you came yesterday to ask me these questions, you could see that I was toiling in the garden and that you took the rake away from me and you had me sit to rest and you took, you, 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 you focused on me. So the most important person was me. And the most important time was exactly when you were talking to me and the most important action you could have done for me at that time was just to help me and then when the man ran up the run up the the path wounded who was the most important person well he was and when was the most important time right then now and what was the most important thing you could have done for him it was to save his life and so you have your answers. The most important person is the person with whom you are at that very moment. And when, uh, and what is the most important thing you could be doing with that person? You could be loving them. You could be serving and helping them. And when is the most important time? Now. Because now is the only time you really ever know you'll ever have. So now, to do a person good, and the person with whom you're with, if you want to be a great king, because I heard I, I heard you talking to your to the person inside the cave there, I can realize that now you are the king. And so if you want to be a great king, that's what you need. Those are the those are the three answers to your questions. So as we go throughout this COVID, what's what's really happening is we are being distanced from each other. We are being essentially afraid of each other because we really don't know what they might be carrying as, as, a, as a disease. And therefore we, are, we have been forced to break these three rules of the great king. The person that we're with is actually, seems to be an enemy in some way, shape or form. Um, we, we, we're distancing from them for what reason? Because we technically are afraid. And therefore, the, the person that we are with, we are been, we've been forced to distance ourselves, And therefore, that person doesn't become the most important person. The most important person is a person with whom you are at that moment, now. And we have been forced by the, these strange rules of the pandemic to not do them good, to actually well, obviously doing them good would be to protect ourselves and them from the pandemic so that we are at least are not, not spreading it. But 
but there's there's more that we can do i think there's there's just more that we can be um and and i don't know how this pandemic got started tell you the truth um i don't think these kinds of things are um are are, are spiritually evil in that sense but essentially all things like this can be used for good or for evil and uh, if you believe in a, in, a, in a higher power, I don't know if you believe in a lower power. But I, I believe in both. I believe in a higher power and a lower power. And the lower power uh, is going to use whatever is going on to its worst possible outcome. And I, I think that's, that's what's happening. The, the lower power may not have caused this but is definitely using this as a way to separate us from each other. Because how can you love somebody if you're separated from them? Well, we have a, an event like this. You and, we, you and I are talking right now. So uh, we, we can Zoom and therefore there's no pandemic to be spread. Uh, but when you're meeting with people you know, uh, in, in communities, um, just remember those three questions. Uh, what can I do? safely to make this person's life better what, what can i do to and not to wait and not to procrastinate it but to do it right now because we never know when there was not going to be another now for us so um as i was thinking about what i want to share with you today that was a that was a, the story that i wanted to remind you of a tolstoy story from one of the greatest storytellers ever to have lived a simple story, but I think very, very profound. And our conversation won't be too much longer today, but uh, I wanted to share that story with you. Um, any thoughts, comments, questions, ahas that you want to share with everybody else, you're welcome to open up your mic and just come on out and chat, chat with all of us. Um, it's, it's your time. I'm going through um, all of your um, audio books on Audible. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, the one that I've got at the moment is um, The Road to Wolf. Um, is there anything that you would add or any things that you could think of from this vantage point now of what we're all going through? What, what books are you reading? What books are you reading now or listening to? Um, well, <laughs> I've got the, <laughs> I'm, I'm, again, I'm building my collection of the physical books as well. So I've got the, um, what's it, um, well, loads of them, but the audio book I'm listening to is The Road to Wolf. Is, is what? Oh, sorry. Is it not clear? No, that last, that last word dropped off and I couldn't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's The Road to Wolf. Aha, uh -huh. Road to Wealth. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. Um, Road to Wealth is a is a, actually a republished name from the original title, which was called The Challenge. And yeah, yeah. Going to an unemployment line, it's like these people from an unemployment line, and then teaching them that they 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 had within them the power to be able to go out and create some wealth, even though they didn't have um, the the outward appearance of wealth. The outward mm -hmm. appearance of wealth is your cash, your cash flow, your credit, your collateral stuff that the banker thinks that makes you wealthy. And what I was trying to teach my unemployed folks is they didn't have a job, they didn't have any money, they didn't have any credit, and they, they didn't have anything really, any external things, but they had their wealth inside them. And creating wealth, mm. you create wealth from using you as the source of your wealth. And that if you have nothing, if you're bankrupt, doesn't mean you're not wealthy. It may, it may just, you're, you're, you just lack the assets that ordinary people have. Uh, when they go into a banker to borrow some money or get a mortgage or things like that, they're always going to look at their external wealth. So uh, the 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 challenge book, which is retitled to the to the road to wealth, was that book. I hope you're enjoying it as you go through it. As as we look at today, there are a lot of people who are being forced to go back to zero, maybe mm -hmm. less than zero. And so the pandemic has is literally going to create hundreds of thousands of bankruptcies. And these hundreds of thousands of bankruptcies will leave people thinking they don't have any assets. The assets they possess are the things that they've learned that are inside them 
they might have lost their physical assets, but their, their internal assets are always with them. And they take those assets wherever they go. So when yeah. I my challenge in San Francisco and they took away my wallet, gave me a hundred dollar bill, I had to buy I had to buy a property in 72 hours using nothing. I used my knowledge, I used my skill, I used my my enthusiasm, I used my determination, my persistence, all that stuff is internal. And so um, when, when we have a, a time like this, and this will look back on 2020 the same way we look back now on 2008. Mm. And, we, and so during this time, some people will create fortunes and some people will lose fortunes and never gain them back again. Yeah, because it's, it's times like this when people say that there's a big change in, well, there can be a big change in of hands as to, you know, where the wealth lies. Yes. Um, so I kind of think it's just kind of, just again, making me aware because I, I teach um, and I've like literally just gone back into the schools. Yes. Um, but it's kind of like I'm just trying to make sure that I don't neglect my entrepreneurial side. Because, um, yeah. yeah, I think sometimes it's kind of easier to go back into the routine of like a, a job. And obviously I do enjoy teaching, but I just don't want to ignore the fact that obviously you can end up without work when the schools are all closed. Oh, um, so you got your have your entrepreneurship entrepreneurial side on the side. You gotta have a side hustle, a side hustle. Mm. You gotta have something going on on the side. Yes, you do. Yeah. Because you're a teacher. Or you're teaching in a school system, but I'm a teacher too. Um, yes, yes, of so course, yeah. You teach you teach your audience through Zoom, like I'm teaching you. Go find an audience to teach, and then some of those some of that audience is going to actually want to share some of their 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 money with you for the things that you teach so you can earn as a teacher you can earn 10 times what you'd earn in a school system yeah there 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 are seven and a half billion students out there just waiting for you right now for you to teach them what you know right that's that's infopreneuring that's to be an information entrepreneur so good luck what's your first name um it's jasmine jasmine yeah jasmine you have a wonderful day I see Thank my friend you. Michael is in the background. Michael, what's this Michael Hiddenbrook? What does that mean, Hiddenbrook? Michael, that, <clears throat> that, that is the community I live in within Vallejo, California. Oh, there we go. Well, it's good to see you, my friend. Michael and I climbed the top of Mount Fuji, so whenever he shows up, uh, he, makes me, he makes me smile. Fuji was a, a wonderful climb. Uh, it, uh, that's probably the last big mountain I'm going to climb. So my, my ex exciting news for the week is I, I started a full-time job in Los Angeles. And because of COVID, I may or may not need to move to Los Angeles. Well, there you go. Wow. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I, I really love that I jumped in on your conversation. We're all teachers. And we can always teach somebody that's a step or two behind us. Yep. So if you think you don't know anything, you might be wrong. Yeah, just remember, just remember when you were ignorant and didn't know what you were doing and had to find somebody who could give you a little leg out. Very good, Michael. I'm That's still great. there. I'm still there. You're still living in the same house that we, you and I talked about a couple of years ago? Uh, well, we went in and out of escrow in two different houses in two different communities before we landed where we are. Ah. But I do remember you coaching me and Amy. Yep. It's either, so I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but yep. your decision should either be heck yeah or no. Yeah. Very good. And happy, and happy wife is a happy life, brother. <laughs> All the other real estate advice aside, we did the right thing. All right. Good to see you, my friend. Thank uh, you. Questions, comments, thoughts, jump in. It's your call. Let's, uh, Thank you, Bob. Who's never hi, Bob. talked before? Who's that? This is Ali. Ali, hi, Ali. I, I really enjoyed your story. Uh, just uh, because of COVID-19, uh, I made the schedule. I call five of our uh, friends every day. And our conversation goes between like two minutes to maybe uh, almost an hour in some cases. Yeah. So just yeah, just touch up bases we haven't seen in seen each other in few months. So uh, 
I find that really uh, rewarding and uh, enjoyable. Ali was uh, a member of a, an inner circle that we had for a year and a half or so. And so he's referring to some of those people who are in that group. Yeah. How's your real estate doing? Did you, did you ever relist it, the, your, your commercial property? Uh, no, I uh, may have. Uh, I, I will be working on converting it to, uh, the, to an assistant living home. Ah. Um, that part, yes. Nice. That's different. Yes, completely different. It didn't work out the uh, first plan. Yeah, but no. pivot. pivot. Yeah. Sounds Everything's good. working good. The business is good. Almost double in business. So ah. we're very busy, yes. Very good. So good to hear that from you, Ali. Thanks. Um, somebody else, question, comment, thought, jump in. Say hi. Bob, I have something I want to share. Uh, when I started, um, when COVID happened and I joined your idea to income group, I felt challenged to write something. And of course my focus was what, what can I write that will eventually bring in money? Along the way, what's been happening is I found out what the real needs are of my community and my community are alpaca owners. Yes. And even though I'm not living day to day, I know they're struggling. So, I scheduled several webinars that were teacher or, or, you know, where I was teaching something. And then I decided to intersperse them with just an opportunity for people to chat. So I now have Let's Talk Alpaca social chats. <laughs> Let's Talk Alpaca. That's good. Let's talk Alpaca. It's a social chat. We do it every other Monday night. There's no agenda. There's no promotions. There's nothing. It's just an opportunity for people um, some of them are still a little too shy to talk, so they do it in the chat, and they say what their challenges are, but instead of it being a gripe session, I have them look at, well, what are their possibilities if they put on their entrepreneurial hat? There you go. What can actually, you know, come out of this that could be positive? And I've been able to put people together, and, uh, you know, I, so your story really, really touched me that I'm finding that's what the need is in the moment, and I'm putting my own you know, long-term goals aside, because that'll still happen at some point. But right now I'm dealing with what is immediate in front of me. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. For you. thanks for sharing give, that story. Give, give, give. Great, super. Uh, Heshi, you want to comment? Heshi, had a thought you wanted to share? Yeah, I'm actually a couple. Um, the story, which I have fortunately heard you tell before, is really about being in your authentic being. And I thought Werner might say something because he's so good at that. Um, just being in the moment of what's right in front of you and just concentrating on that. And it's just a really great reminder. And, and then um, I was on my way back from the hospital today and I thought the only place I've been since March 15th is the hospital or to a doctor. And I thought, oh my gosh, I would love to go to a restaurant. Oh. And I can't do that. I mean, because I'm at really high risk. And then I began thinking, well, look at all the things I get to do, even though I can't go to a restaurant. So I found this is really a, um, a, time, to, a time for rediscovery yep. and using imagination and being creative about what you can do rather than what you can't do. And there's so many people out of work. And if they really thought about it, they're not, they don't have to be out of work because there's so much to do. Even reaching out on to Facebook and saying, I'm out of work and I'm out of ideas. Can someone talk to me? I mean, there's, there's just no end to the possibilities of who we are and who we can be if we just stretch a little bit. So every time I listen to you, I think about how much more I need to stretch. <laughs> hey, Heshi, you have a great day. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Somebody else jump in. Say, say hi. Let's chat. What's going on? Hi, Bob. Yeah. Victoria. Hi, Bob. Oh. Uh, Victoria? Yeah. Hey there. Jump in. Uh, yeah. So um, I love the story because one, one major factor was the the fact that there was two needs going on, he, the king needed his, his needs met, 
So he exchanged that, let me help you out. There was a need he saw to help out this, um, I forgot what he was, um, to help the first, the was, yeah. So there was that need and then there was a pressing need. And I'm seeing now with COVID, it seems like there's unlimited needs and you have, in order to be successful and to grow, you have to prioritize. Like he couldn't, he couldn't shovel for this guy and then help save this guy's life. I'm finding here, I'm in California in the midst of all the fires. Um, mm. And um, besides COVID and all those other things, it seems like one layer after another is coming this way. And I'm sure in other, in other areas of the world and nation, it's happening as well. Um, and I was talking to Heshi about this this past week, um, but it's led to my severe migraines. I've had them for three weeks straight off and on. It's been horrible. And one of my prized joys was um, taking these walks to clear my mind, think, and reset for the day. But with the smoke being so bad, it's difficult now to do that. And so um, I was thinking about your story, and I just loved how, you know, it, it's, it's about prioritizing. Okay, so maybe I can't go for a walk, but you know what? What else is in front of me? And not letting, even if the, the hits keep coming, not letting it stop me because something will happen. I mean, that's how I found your ideas to income book. I mean, excuse me, class. <laughs> and that leads me to a question from you, Robert. I've been reading your book, The Four, um, oh, yes, The Four Maps. I'd like to ask um, how, I know you're probably really good at this now, but someone who's a beginner and starting this, it's funny, I'm starting this in this complete chaos growing where I'm living. But how would you recommend we move forward with that as far as start with five minutes, do the best I can? What's your advice to at least get started and move forward? Well, guess how many people, guess how many minutes the average person reads, the average American reads every day? <laughs> I'd say seven, maybe. Seven minutes? 30. Five? <laughs> Less than five. It's average, so some people read an hour. Uh, the average, it's, it's been about 30 minutes. It's gone down over the last couple of years to like 28 minutes or something like that. Mm. Uh, regular, regular reading. Um, th that's uh, the way I uh, keep myself, keep, keep my brain cranking is, is reading. Uh, I'm rereading the, uh, the auto or the biography of Alexander. Again, what a guy, unbelievable. And just rereading, it just kind of gets my mind sparking. So it, it's back to your, your question, Victoria, just finding a time where you just literally say, I've got to exercise, I've got to exercise my brain. And so in other words, I have to read. I've got to exercise my brain. I've got to exercise my body. I've got to exercise my, my brain. I've got to exercise my spirit. So every day I try to do those three, three exercises is what I do. Thank you, Victoria. Okay, somebody else jump in, say, say hello. We need a guy. We got a lot of women talking here. Okay, oh, this is Werner. Give me a this guy. Oh, it's Werner. Okay, Werner, as Heshi said, you're the most authentic guy she knows. <laughs> well, I pay a lot of money. <laughs> Actually, Julie triggered it and then Heshi picked up on that. Uh, Julie talked about the moment. And really what the king needed to learn from my perspective, and I absolutely love this story, is what is it like to be living in the moment yeah. and seeing what is needed in the moment. And my biggest revelation really came in my climbing. And I had no intention of doing this or learning this. But what I became so aware of is that when I'm in the moment, which yeah. you cannot not be when you're on a mountain, yeah. Everything changes in terms of the beauty of the landscape, the beauty of the people, the beauty of the sky, the, just everything. And it's goosebump time even as I'm talking about it. <laughs> and then coming back and realizing that in one-on-one, -on -one, if I can remain in the moment, I cannot step on you. Ooh. Only when I get back into my fear that I might step on you or take something from you that I shouldn't be taking. Because my authenticity and being in the moment can only lead me to supporting the grass that's outside my house, uh, the people that are around me, 
the community that I'm with. I have no option because together we win. Yeah. Separately, we kill each other. Yeah. And it's all about living in the moment, being present. And it started for me being present with myself because I didn't have a clue who I was for 60, 70 years, maybe 60 years. I had no clue who I was. Now I have a sense. Yeah. Welcome, uh, Werner, the Guinness Book of World Record holder for the oldest human to climb the seven tallest peaks in the world. Do I just start talking? So Thank you, Werner. Thank you, Werner. Welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Somebody else, jump in. Say what's Robert, on your mind. Robert, this is Rick from San Diego. Hey, Rick. What's up? Hey there. Well, I, I was uh, in a severe car accident. I know you were in a very severe car accident uh, before, and I, you know, was a national championship winning athlete, four state titles, gold medal winner, and all of a sudden I totaled a beautiful sports car with my son in it between San Diego and LA and a horrendous rainstorm that just, uh, I was going 20 miles under the speed limit, but still, you know, just crazy accident happened. But I hurt my back, became immobilized, and, you know, just ended up putting on hundreds of pounds of weight, have taken off, you know, almost 300 pounds of that weight and still heading down to my, uh, my old fighting shape. Wow. But I was living in Playa del Carmen, Mexico after moving from Hawaii, you know, swimming was what I was able to do with my back and didn't like the time zone in Hawaii. So I ended up being in Playa del Carmen right by uh, Cancun, living sure. on the beach. But I had rented this uh, two-story brand, you know, less than two-year-old uh, penthouse, sleeps eight because so many people were going to be coming down and supporting me, but nobody ended up coming. <laughs> you know, like, and so uh, this brand new building, the elevator broke all the time. It was just this ridiculous thing. And I'm on the, obviously the top floor and having to walk down with this back injury. And I ended up re-injuring my back, which I hadn't had problems for over a year at that point. And I got so terrified being alone, you know, in Mexico, I was writing letters to my mother, my son, my sister-in-law, like, if I don't check in every day, you know, here's my address, here's where I live, in case I fell with my back thing and threw my phone or something and just nobody knows where I'm at. That's how terrified I was. I prayed to God saying, you know, I will fly anyone down here just to have a companion. I've offered that to other people, but I really need this. And on Christmas Day, uh, I'd finally, I was in so much pain, I couldn't walk, I couldn't swim, I couldn't do anything. And I finally, you know, got better to where I went swimming for the first day on Christmas Day. And there was a gentleman sitting there, you know, after my swim, six o'clock at night, drunker than drunk could be. And I just started talking to him, really good English. And turns out he says, it's my birthday. You know, and I've just had a few and I was like, oh, it's your birthday. I was like, wow. And here I am just soaking wet, you know, got a towel around me. I said, listen, you know, don't know you from Adam, but I'd love to treat you to dinner, you know, anywhere in the city. He's been here for 20 years. I expected to, you know, I said, no cost, just anywhere you want to go. And I said, I got to go back to my place and change first. Long story short, back at my place and, you know, change my clothes. He's like, oh, I like your place. And and I, I had moved from the, the penthouse thing down to ground level almost, just one story up just because I couldn't obviously do the stairs. And, and then I said, where do you want to go, man? Anywhere you want. He's like, you know, I haven't been to Kentucky Fried Chicken in a long time. <laughs> and I was like, oh, come on. You know, we got a, got a dream bigger than this. He's like, no, I really, I don't want to impose. It's such a nice gesture. Uh, you know, I don't want to be greedy. And I said, anyway, we ended up going to K KFC and he says, uh, instead of eating there, which I don't like to eat my food cold, uh, he's like, oh, I want to go back to your place. Long story short, afterwards, he's like, hey, listen, you know, I got to I gotta go find a hotel and this and that. And uh, and I was like, where are you going? You, I got this amazing place. Like, you're not going anywhere. You know, just sit your butt down. I got him some blankets and stuff. And long story short, this guy was a stone cold alcoholic. I've never, I've, I've seen alcoholics here and there, but I've never had someone in my presence and I'm talking about waking up like, oh, you know, and cracking a beer. And I'm just like, unbelievable. But I just had my heart to reach out to this person, uh, just sharing my testimony, sharing the power. I said, he says, it's not possible. I've tried to quit. I've tried this. I've tried that. And I said, you know, this is, it's going to sound weird, but I said, I can literally love you through anything, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, he's sitting there with me, and I said, I'll tell you what. I said, I don't have an addiction with with alcohol, with drugs or anything else. Like, I can't possibly imagine it, but I, I, I'm a, obviously a guy that likes my food, you know. And I said, with the power of God and power of prayer together, 
I said, if you give up your drinking, which you've got plenty of food and everything else to, you know, give you anything you want. I said, I will give up eating. I'll just have water only, you know? And he was like, you could last one day, you know? And I said, buddy, I can last 40 days and 40 nights if I need to, you know, I, I said, you know, no problem. And, and he sat here, uh, you know, with me 24 seven. And he, he said, I'm, I'm not, I'm not even trying that, but I'll watch you, you know? And after 12 days, of sitting here with him, you know, him as my witness sitting there saying, uh, you know, you're not dying of hunger. You're not like, I said, I'm, I'm totally fine. He was getting my water for me. And you know, you have to buy your water, obviously, but the punchline was he finally sat here with that inspiration. We're reading the Bible every day. I mean, six, seven hours a day, we were sitting here because it'd been a while since he'd opened a Bible. And the punchline is he finally sat here, uh, gave up his, uh drinking and it was tough i mean this was not a i'm talking about you would you think i'm exaggerating i'm talking about 30 40 beers a day you know like kind of a person and i've never I, and there wasn't like anything much else either a couple eggs here and there but i mean it was just crazy and the punchline was you know after 12 days of this he finally you know gave up the drinking did it with me i did it for another seven days i've done 40 day water only fast so i kind of had an ace in the hole knowing that uh, you know i i knew this was possible and he just said, listen, I, I don't want, he didn't want me to go any further. He says, I'll quit drinking. But I, I he was so scared. I was just going to die on him uh, that he says, I will be your chef. I I'm, I'm gifted. You know, you buy the food, do this, do that. And so the whole punchline is not about this guy necessarily. It's about the fact that I was praying for someone to be here to have, because I was so afraid of being alone and being hurt and stuff. And this crazy random story, I didn't even figure out later that was God sitting there on Christmas day, giving me this person said it was his birthday his random story uh he gave up drinking he became my live-in chef all the way until the country you know until i had to leave on on march 14th for this but in his lunch hour when he's making me six seven meals a day he doesn't obviously have to take a lunch break but i still give him the time off and all that kind of stuff he would go to the park and read the bible for that hour every single day five days a week to just people in the park and he sometimes five three sometimes only one person but so there was always somebody that he was reading to and I already had my ticket home on March 14th, obviously became dear friends during the process. And, uh, I, I went and got him his own apartment, furnished it, paid him all the way through the end of June, which was my original agreement. And that was it. I had my ticket for March 14th, Friday the 13th. I went out for my last swim. Uh, he'd fed me a couple hours before. And so I didn't get any, you know, that cramping within the next two hours of eating kind of thing. And, uh, I got up from our, my favorite chair left my phone there said, Hey buddy, I'm heading out. He's like, all right, buddy. You know, and he was making himself something. And I walk out, there was a, you know, this is the middle floor of a three story uh, building. And you know, the difference between a little uh, support wall versus an actual eight inch support wall that's actually holding up something. It was that kind of a concrete thick wall with a little three and a half foot wide gap, eight inches thick. I walked through it, did a button hook to my right where my little wardrobe was. I was just going to pull down my shorts, pull on some swim trunks, and then walk out 70 feet out the, you know, giant security doors. When I walked through that thing, turned the corner, facing the wall I just walked through, I hadn't even got my thumbs up to my waistline when a giant movie-like gas explosion happened in the kitchen. A wall of flame came, you know, through that little one opening, three and a half feet wide, not a foot in front of my face, I was doing the Tom Arnold thing from True Lies, patting myself down, thinking, you know, I must, I must be on fire, I must be on something, but it blew out the windows, thir a third-inch thick, court, you know, security glass, eight foot wide, just blew them out in a million pieces, giant fireball out for everybody to see and hear all across the city block. I'm still, I'm not on fire, I'm, nothing's happened to me, and I'm, it took me a second to realize that, oh my God, you know, Chef Michael is, was in that room, you know, and I'm not a military guy, I've never been around someone, you know, blowing up in an IUD or something like that, but I had to get the courage and walk in here. I walked around because he was, you know, 15 feet in the far back corner of the room. And as soon as I walked in the corner, I, my feet hit his head that was right here at the doorway. And I looked down, his whole body was attached, thank God, but he was dead. He was sitting there, head turned to my right, uh, my right, his left, with a slow, you know, forming pool of blood coming out of his forehead. And I, I sat, you know, I've, held my dad when he passed away and I found my aunt when she had passed away, but this was just on a whole different level of trauma. And I, you know, I, there was no, there was no inner voice saying, Rick, you need to lean down and, you know, put the two fingers on the pulse and see if he's, you know, still, I'm like, 
inner voice is like, Chef Michael's dead, bro. You know, and I'm looking around the room, uh, seeing parts of the, the stove was blown out four or five feet from the corner. There's parts of the grill and metal stuff all over the room. Uh, it's about a minute after I've walked in the room, but it seems like four or five minutes. I'm just sitting there. I wasn't crying. It wasn't that, uh, it wasn't that energy to cry. But all of a sudden, just like if you're in a movie when they do the paddles on a person in the hospital and they lift off a few inches off the, you know, you know their chest comes up. I swear, you know, uh, God, somebody sat there and just shocked this guy back into life, came eight or nine inches off the ground, just, you know, scared the living bejeebies out of me. My soul, you know, jumped out of my body. He doesn't know. He, I didn't find out till three weeks later that it was all in real time for him. He just thought he got blown across the room and then popped right up like a Superman. Uh, I was like, no, you, dude, you were dead. You know, he didn't have any afterlife experience or seeing the light or anything, but in his, in his world, it happened immediately. He looked up, saw that I was perfectly fine and knew that I was in the same place. So he thought he was fine. He reached up to wipe the sweat he thought was on his face and just came with a handful of blood all over from all the lacerations on his face. And I was just like, grabbed him by the shoulders and said, Michael, <laughs> you blew yourself up. You know, and we have to go, you know, get him cleaned up as best I could. We walk out to this crowd of 50 to 100 people all out there that obviously, you know, heard and saw the thing. There's all these restaurants around our house. And when we walked out, it was the simultaneous, Dios mio, you know, uh, because people just prayed, obviously, that there wasn't anybody in there, you know, oh, my God type thing. And I look like the new newly incarnated Superman that completely unscathed after this, you know, after this uh, explosion. Well, that was on the Friday the 13th, as I said. I had to prove that I'd already bought my ticket to leave the country before the explosion uh, because they weren't trying to let me leave the country. But that guy lost every single piece of hair in his body, um, a few layers of skin off the bottom of his feet, meaning bloom out of his shoes, and then the, the skin just like peeled pieces of cheese that hadn't quite finished. Just horrible. Eyelashes gone, so he can't keep tears in his eyes as he's walking around. People just saying, lo siento, lo siento, as he's walking but the punchline of that whole thing is the miracle of this guy. Like if you had seen what I saw and the explosion that happened and this guy inside of it, you know, there's no, there's no uh, chance this guy is actually coming back to life. Like it was a dead moment, a horrific thing. And I just honestly believe in my heart of hearts that, you know, the angels are just around this guy mm -hmm. reading scripture in the park, you mm -hmm. know, for months not because I told me should, or he just said, Oh, I want to share what I've learned. I want to share what I'm feeling. And I just swear, uh, there is no other, you know, someone's a non-believer. It's just like, buddy, you did not see what I saw to, to not believe that someone was just wrapping this guy up. And anyway, I just wanted to share that. I know you were in a horrible accident and had to rebuild your life and learn to, you know, get this stuff back. I'm, I'm in my fight to get back to, to my old fighting shape. But anyway, just want to share that with you. I know how much you've been an influence on me uh, with your faith. There's nothing wrong with being successful, earning money. Uh, you know, I give a lot. The, the jobs I create, the things that I do, you know, I had a real problem, to be honest, with the Rick, early wealth that I had. thank you so much for, your, for that story. Um, wow. Wow. Um, I think you came into his life. He was, he needed you. And uh, so thank you for sharing that story. With my us, my pleasure. That was, uh, that was a shocking story. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> thank you. You're Why welcome. Did somebody else uh, want to? Hello. Add? I uh, did. It's Bunny. Hey, Bunny. Hey, you know, wow, what a story. And like I said, hey, here's Robert to help you write your book, for goodness sake, sake Rick. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I mean, really. And my story, you know, is, is, is ironic. I'm just going, he's talking about kind of everything I was going to talk about, but not, because sure. obviously I don't have the same story. I was in a rollover car accident five and a half years ago. Uh, I went up, uh, my truck was sideswiped by an 80 year old grandma running a red light. She plowed into the side of it. I went about 34 feet, 40 feet in the air. And I know we only have six minutes, so I'm hurrying. <laughs> um, I crossed over. I had a phenomenal experience, which I'm being prompted to share some of that now. I, I, what do you mean by being, you crossed over? What do you mean by I, 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 I died. I, I died and I went through the veil or, or whatever you want to call it. And uh, 
I saw how beautiful and magnificent it is over there. And I tell people, close your eyes and envision the most beautiful place you have ever seen, the most beautiful flower garden you have ever been in. Okay, and when you're there and you're with the aromas and the, and the flowers and the scents and everything and the, even the touch of a flower and the feeling of it. And now that you're there, multiply it about a, by about a million, oh. a million. Wow. And you will have begin to have an idea of how incredibly beautiful it is on the other side. And I tell people going through all this stuff, stay in a space of love. If you stand, and of course, stand up for what's right. Absolutely. You know, there's this, this, this virus has been created by evil people, sadly enough, but God is still on his throne. He is still our father. He still loves us. He knows everything that's going on in your life. And if Rick's story isn't oh. a testament of that, I don't know what is. Yeah. And he's aware of you. He knows what you need. And when you think you've lost it all, because like recently, of course, all my savings is gone. I've had to live. I had to live off my savings. I like Rick gained a lot of weight. I wasn't an I was an athlete, but I wasn't an Olympic, you know, gold medalist or anything. But I, you know, I I, <laughs> I gained a ton of weight. And thank you, Warner. We're in this wonderful group together, and I am still moving forward. I've shed, uh, eradicated, excuse me, another seven pounds off my body. Whoop, whoop. I've uh, I gained almost 200, and I'm at uh, 121 pounds gone now. Thank you very much. Still a lot to go. Working on it. And uh, thank you for being such an inspiration, Robert, and for just being there. And my friends, I've gotten them to join, and they love you so much. And the, the whole thing is, is when you think you have nothing more because I got hacked <laughs> recently, and that's why I wasn't on a couple of calls. Um, my phone was hacked into uh, through someone who I had trusted, and then he was hacked by another hacker, and I got caught in the crossfire. My Facebook page was wiped out. My accounts, I had to shut all my credit cards down, everything. And it's like, okay, God, now where do I go? Now what do I do? Because I was just about to sign up to get into your book club, darn it, to help me write my book. So... It's okay. Somehow he's going to provide. And he's wanting me to do uh, in my in God, in my inspired thought, however you want to say it. I say the Holy Ghost. Um, I'm, you know, of all people, Kelly Clarkson needs Spanish lessons. Uh -huh. So I'm like, hey, you know what? If she needs Spanish lessons with all the things that are going on out there, they say that when you're ready, your, your, uh, your master or your teacher will appear. And so, bueno, yo les voy a hablar en español. I am going to start teaching Spanish uh, online. There you go. So hey, Bonnie, there you go. Bonnie, this, uh, this near-death experience that you had, yes. I, sure, I sure hope you've written it down as much detail as you could. Have you written it yet? Uh, no, I've not written it. See, hello, help, help, help. Well, I need you to help me write my book. Well, so well, pray for the money. Well, let's, start with the, let's start with the just you telling the story in every detail that you can. What, what do you remember? Are you, not to do it now. No. For you to record it. Right. Uh, then you can take that recording. Uh, actually, if you're doing, if you're doing a, a Zoom, Literally, the Zoom will transcribe every word you speak. I don't know if you knew that, but like this, what I'm talking to you right now mm -hmm. is being transcribed. And wow. When it's done, it'll, it'll be all transcribed. You need to, if you have a Zoom account, you need to just all by yourself, just tell the story. Yeah. Because it's a very, very special experience you had. Yeah, yeah. it really was. Ah, making me cry. Yeah. <laughs> So what are the lessons you brought back with you when you came back to this, to this place called Earth? What, what did you learn from that journey you took to the next world? What did you learn? Well, for one, <laughs> service is the greatest thing that you can do in this life. And that's what you're doing right now. Um, there is no fear on the other side. It's all love. Mm. And uh, I know a lot of people don't believe in Jesus Christ. However, everyone knows on the other side that Jesus is the Christ. And he's the one who sent me back. He's like, you're not done. I'm like, oh, come on. It's so gorgeous here. My, my mom and dad are here and granny's here and I want to stay. And he's like, no, you got to go back. I'm like, oh, I want to stay. <laughs> I know 
who argues with the Lord, right? <clears throat> but I humbled myself and I, I thought of my love for my family here. Cause he's like your siblings that won't be able to handle your death. And uh, I'm like, oh, come on. And you think of your love for them. And in that moment, uh, you're, you're, and then suddenly you're in, back inside your body, which dying didn't hurt. That didn't hurt. It was getting back in my body. And I was like, ow. Why do, I, yeah. Yeah, why do I love them so much? But the, one of the greatest things, too, was, um, of course, my family's military, a lot of them. And that was, uh, they talked to me. Whew, sorry, um, about how we here in America are not appreciating the sacrifice that they've made. Yeah. Sorry, and that we need to be so grateful every day that we are free, every day that we get up, that we have the opportunity to do whatever we choose to do. Yeah. That freedom is a God-given gift yeah. that we have the right to to think and be as we want to be and make any decision that we can, we can go out and do anything. If I want to get in my truck and drive to California tomorrow, I can do it. Yeah. And I have no one that can stop me because God's greatest gift to his children is free agency, that we are agents unto ourselves, yeah. that we have every, every capacity, every right and, and instilled in each of us, is a gift is something that only you can do if you are on this work and you are in this world you have a mission you have something that only you can do figure it out ask him be still in silence and prayer and meditation and ask him what is it father you created me you have me in this world for a reason what is it that you would have me do? And you know, you will know automatically because of the gifts that he's given you. And talents are gifts from God, whether you realize it or not. Everything has been, it's like, it's like he's given you a nice little tool package and each of your tools that are instilled in you are what he wants you to do with your life. Just figure it out. And like Rick, Rick needed someone to help him. He needed someone at his house. And boy, that man was going through hell. He was going through all those challenges. And, and, and someone, you know, he needed someone to inspire him to let go, to stop being a slave to alcohol. Because when you are involved in al alcohol or drugs or anything that are going on, you're a slave to it. And God doesn't Thank want you to be a slave. Thank yes. You. Thank you for sharing uh, your powerful story. You have my email address, author .com. I want you to, to uh, Hello. write that story. Write okay. That story. I'd, I'd like to read it. All right. Uh, Hello. You were given that experience. Therefore, that's your gift. And you Thank can you. share that gift with more people. Somebody else is saying hello. Who's that, Sam? Hey, buddy. Sam. Good. Sam. Good. Robert, your, your story that you told about the most important person, you told me that in 1986, and I live by that story. I always have. I've done a lot of sales and marketing, and everybody, I teach young men and women now, and I tell them the stories that you told me back in 86, and, you know, I talk, I mean, you you literally gave me a, a, a life. I was able to raise my kids with your book and your knowledge, and still doing it today and all. And Robert, just to hear that story again, it takes me back 35 years, man. Wow. Yeah. I'm the guy that you brought, you bought a t-shirt with uh, plastic fingers on it that said, get a grip on yourself. <laughs> yeah. I was the basket case in the room. You and Don Wolf uh, took me in a private session. Yeah. Oh, okay. But, but I broke through, man. It took me a few more years, but I broke through. And uh, when I got to be about 29 years old, I had to uh, completely destroy the person I was and spend a year and a half rebuilding the person I wanted to be. There you go. Yeah. My family became, I was putting all of my businesses first and leaving my family by the wayside. And I came to a point in my life where uh, it was a choice. It was either them or my business. And the reason I was don't, so hard on the business because I had a stepdaddy that told me I wasn't going to amount to nothing and I wanted to prove him wrong. Yeah. Got myself up to over a million dollars in net equity. And over the next year and a half, I lost everything, but I kept my family. Still got them today. Yeah, I started all over again, man. And, it, and actually, I started this time 
with love and caring and kindness. And there that made it instead of anger, you know, and, and uh, I built a, a better future and a better life because of it. And Robert, that week down in San Diego, I still get chills from Chariots of Fire, man. <laughs> you, you programmed it in my head. Yeah, yeah. And when, every time I listen to that song, oh, God, you know what it does to me. You were there. Yeah. Um, uh, did you did you get a chance to look at my, my uh, email? I did. I did. Uh, okay, I as long as you got I it. I haven't that's good. studied it completely because it was quite quite an email. But yeah, uh, and that's just that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, there's a whole lot more. But I just wanted you to read that basic story and or at least uh, the, the synopsis of it. And I, I wrote uh, in the back of it. There's like a one and a half page synopsis of the whole book. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, uh, it's, isn't it amazing? This 1986, we had a. Are we intersected for a? Few and here we are hours? again. You know, you're the oldest friend that I have. I don't know. <laughs> I don't have. Everybody else died on me. You saying I'm an old friend? Oh well, 35 <laughs> years. Yeah, okay. 35 years, the longest friend I've had. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Uh, okay. And thank well, you. This was a really special uh, session today. Uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing, all of you, and uh, those of you who wanted to share. Go out if you if you uh, go out and tell somebody what you're going to say today because our time is is expired. Um, I love you. I love uh, you. I wish you all a wonderful weekend, and uh, we'll see you again next Thursday, same time, same place. Everybody, thumbs up. Thumbs up. There we go. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Love Bob. you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Bob. This is great. You're welcome, everybody. See you. Bye, bye, everybody. Million See you next birth. week. That's quite a name. Yes. Slobo, is it? Tasha, <laughs> and Nicole, and Kareen, and thank you, everybody. Kohiba, Ken, great job. Thank you, Ken. Freddie, you, Charles, Mary, Kevin, my good buddy Kevin. Yeah, Nancy from Hawaii. Hi, Nancy. Yeah, I'll, I'll never forget you, Nancy. Carla and Charles and Freddie and Brian and Nicole, your names are important. I hope that the world will be able to, to receive your gifts. Have a wonderful day. I love you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bob. Have, Thank have you, a Bob. wonderful week. Bye-bye.